It's great to be with you. Um, would you pray with me? And then we'll, we'll spend some time in the scripture. Yeah, let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for Sunday afternoon. We thank you for a moment to gather and find again our footing to sense reality, the reality which uh, is often easily forgotten or suppressed, the truth of your reign and your great love and mercy, your presence in our lives, your leading and guiding the course of all things, of history, of nations. And we pray, Father, that you help us to sense some of the grandeur, uh, that we might be filled with some wonder um, in a wonderless society, God. Cause us also, Father, to sense your love and all that it means to sense your love, to be confronted by it, challenged and shaped by it, to be encouraged and lifted up from wherever we are at. We thank you, God, for the bread and the cup which we share, for the scriptures which uh, are still giving witness to the truth. We thank you. Thank you for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I'm glad to be with you guys. Uh, tomorrow, uh, I'm going home. Well, this is my home. I shouldn't put it like that. I'm sorry. This is my home. Um, but I'm going to where I grew up, and the high is like 13. Uh, so uh, we dug our down coats and boots out of storage. I thought, thought I was done with those forever, but I guess not. Um, uh, but yeah, this is my favorite time of year by like a million miles, um, especially now that I live here because it's, the, the weather's actually uh, bearable. Um, uh, I don't know where you land with this time of year, um, but I hope uh, with each passing year in your experience of God, uh, this time looms up larger, uh, uh, th that you might see the great gift we have in Jesus Christ. I, I love listening to, I, have, have you listened to, Spotify just put out finally Ray, the Ray Charles Christmas. You, you don't know about this? Oh, congratulations. Ray Charles Christmas. Go, go look it up. Uh, so I love that. I love, you know, I play, I play records. Like, I love listening to, like, Perry Como and whatever, Burl Ives. You know, I love that part of this time of year. Uh, but as I get older and I spend more time in Scripture, I'm discovering something that I think I've missed much of my life which is the, the gift of the Messiah, uh, personally, what that means. Uh, but then, of course, for all creation. Um, but we're not actually at Christmas yet, according to uh, the tradition of uh, many parts of the church. Anyone remember what moment this is in the calendar? Advent. Well done. You've been present uh, for the last three weeks. Okay. <laughs> I was wondering how that would go. That's satisfactory, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Advent. And Advent is not first and foremost like some kind of preparation or primer for Christmas. Uh, Advent is its own season, which summons the believing community into the, the, the happenedness of the gospel. That is, that something, an event, something transpired, which changed history, which has changed the way we interact with time. I'll spare you the, the philosophy lesson that I tried to give a few weeks ago. But the idea is with Advent that the church lives between moments. Does this make sense? The birth the death and resurrection and ascension of our Lord and his arrival in the future. That's what the word advent means, arrival, a coming. We live, the church is positioned since the first century all the way until now. We've been living between moments and we are that church. That ancient group of Christians we read about, that's us. Now, 
We are them and they are us and we live still between these moments. The fact that that's where we live should have an, an impact on how we live. That's the idea. Um, so, yeah, but, but today we are going to get into uh, the, the text, one of the texts that is connected to Christmas, because it's this arrival of the Lord in a human body that is so important for us. Um, now, I'm sure you're familiar with the Christmas story. Uh, my fear is that you have the wrong story. Um, <laughs> Uh, there, there are, in fact, no angry old innkeepers in the Bible. Jesus is not actually kicked out of a hotel. They're not, they're not, it's, that would be an abhorrent thought for, a, for a, 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 a people who put a special emphasis on hospitality. To say, no, 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 pregnant woman, you can't come in here. Get out of here. That's insane. That's not actually the story the text tells. And I would just invite you to go back and read the first couple of chapters of Luke and you might sense something else. But the, the story of Jesus' birth, which uh, takes up residence in our imaginations, needs, I think, to be reexamined by Scripture. Well, what we find is uh, that they're speaking about the birth of the long-awaited one in terms that makes most sense to them. Some of that, unfortunately, will mean hard work for us to grasp because we live in a different society at a different time, a later stage in the story. Now, I'm not going to look at Luke with you. We're going to look at Matthew, so I don't actually have a slide for you. Uh, sorry. You can listen to, to me read it or you could turn it your, on your own, but Matthew chapter 1, uh, verse 18, and we're going to read like I don't know, eight verses or something like that. Uh, Matthew 8. I'm sorry, Matthew 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child, or having in her belly, is what the, the, the Greek text says, uh, from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, look, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Joseph, when Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, and he knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. You've heard this before, right? What a story. What a beginning for everything we rest upon as Christians. This is the beginning of our story in some sense. I think we discover something about ourselves by hearing Matthew's words, by the way. We'll, we'll find out. But Matthew in the first 17 verses, Matthew chapter 1 up to verse 18, it's that part of the New Testament, the very first part that you raced past. You know why, right? Because it's just a list of names for 17 lines, name after name after name after name. 
Uh, Now Matthew begins, and he actually says, the text says, this is the genesis of Jesus Christ. He wants us, he's quoting a specific line that shows up several times in the book of Genesis. But he wants us, right out the gate, to interact with the story of the birth of Jesus Christ as if it was a creation story. As if it was an origin story connected to God's people, which means God's promises to his people. These first 17 lines are all about the faithfulness of God to his people. And he's not doing just history, just doing like some kind of familytree.com or what is it, ancestry.com where you send your blood in the mail. It's not one of those things. He's telling history with a theological flair to it. He's not giving you every single name from Jesus back to Abram, but he's crafted a way of telling Jesus' genealogy in three stages. How you doing? From Abram to King David, from King David to the exile. Fourteen generations between, uh, between each. And the, the genealogy itself actually spells David, which is pretty ingenious. Uh, it spells it using Hebrew, Hebrew characters. That's how you write 14. You can write 14 by writing David in Hebrew. It's really cool. Um, but, but the idea here is it's tr- Matthew's trying to connect Jesus to God's ancient promises to Abram and through David that there would be a, a, a king which would sit on the throne forever and ever. But things didn't feel like that in in the time of Jesus' birth if you were one of Israel or if you were Jewish. Uh, So he's trying to connect Jesus in the first 17 lines to Abram, to Abraham, I'm sorry, and David. In these lines, he's connecting Jesus to God. And this is this is overwhelming if we were to sit with this for a moment. And and imagine, imagine being poor Joseph. (laughs) Uh, Joseph, by the way, another dreaming Joseph in the Bible. Uh, We encounter a man who is probably, either he's gotten his heart there or he is, in fact, excited about marrying this young woman. Uh, Because engagement, uh, betrothal, in Jesus' day is, is not quite like what we're used to, where you... You go on a singles cruise or something like that, and the sparks fly, and you're like, oh, I think I feel something for her or for him. Uh, it's, it's much more clinical in Jesus' day. Your parents hook it up for you. Uh, they make the call when you're still pretty young. And so Jesus, uh, Joseph, has been paired off with young Mary. Uh, and and they're, they're betrothed, so about a year before they would ever take the plunge. But it's as good as done (laughs) for Joseph. In fact, you see, they're betrothed, yet he talks about her in terms of wife and husband and divorce. Like, wait a second, you're not even married. How can you be divorced? See, it's 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 quite a commitment already at betrothal. But imagine now your your fiancé comes to you, uh, and she's got news that she's pregnant. And it's from the Holy Spirit, don't worry. Like, yeah, I've heard that one before. (laughs) And now imagine if Joseph just signs off on it. Well, okay. Like that sets him up to look like a cuckold, right? He, he, he looks like one who's been uh, tricked, right? His, his, his fiance has already cheated on him. They're not even at the altar yet. But he, he's a good guy, so he doesn't want to create a situation where people are like, look at Mary, she cheated. She had a good thing going, but she decided to cheat. But he has to wrestle with this situation. Are you going to risk your reputation and stay with this woman? That's a question uh, that I think will be posed to us in a, in a moment. But uh, he needs some help. <laughs> and so the, the, the Lord appears to him in the angel of the Lord. And now the idea that, that a, a woman could give birth without having sex by the Holy Spirit is, is new. <laughs> it's new even for the Bible. 
Oh yeah, you, you, it's not as cut and dry as you think. He, he offers this line from Isaiah chapter 7. I'll talk about that in a moment. But, but it's not that cut and dry. This is pretty surprising. But it's not totally off the grid uh, that God would work this way. Um, because Israel has had some experience with miracle children, uh, miracle births, or barren mothers, which is an oxymoron, barren, barren mother. You can't, you're one or the other. But let's see if this will work. Ah, yes. There are no less than six, sorry, help me count those. Okay. Six, though, uh, which are given the title barren. In, in the Bible. Uh, uh, they, they, they can't have kids. Uh, many of them are beyond the age of having children. And if you look, if you're familiar with the story of the Bible, look where these women appear within the story. They're at strategic moments. They show up. Um, Sarah, uh, Abram's wife, and then uh, their son, she has a miracle child. Uh, her son gets engaged to Rivka, and Rivka is in for, uh, barren. And then they eventually have miracle children. Um, and their son, Yaakov, uh, gets married to Rachel. And Rachel is barren. Um, and so the first three women in the story of Israel's scriptures are barren. It's the Bible's way of saying, see, you're a miracle. Don't be too puffed up thinking you're so awesome. You couldn't be if God didn't act. Amen. The people of God are themselves a miracle. The work of God from the dead womb. Paul calls it Sarah's dead womb. That's a, that's a nice way of thinking about what barrenness actually might mean. But then, of course, the wife of Manoach, which is anyone who's, whose child is, uh, who's, what child does she have? Samson. Samson. Uh, Samson clobbers folks. Uh, uh, yeah, de great deliverer in Israel's story. Right at a crucial moment. And then Hannah, whom I named my daughter after Hannah because I love the story of Hannah so much. Hannah is, is barren um, and she gives birth to Samuel who has a hand in anointing King David. Right at the beginning of Israel's kingdom days, at the beginning of Israel's monarchy is a barren woman. In case you were to think you're so awesome, you could point back like, ah, uh, yeah, guys, you weren't supposed to be. So settle down. But this is how God works. And then, uh, of course, the Shunammite woman, which I won't talk about, but Elizabeth at the very beginning of the New Testament, at another crucial moment with Israel's, Israel's story, she gives birth to anyone? John, the baptizer. Um, but then, then Mary shows up. And it's like one step beyond being barren. She doesn't even touch a man. The Holy Spirit creates in her a miracle child. The Holy Spirit does this. It's not like just run-of-the-mill miracle. God himself is the father of of the creature inside her. It's God. It's Mary's son, but it's God's son. And the angel tells Joseph, don't be afraid to throw it all on the line and risk it. I know how this looks. It's scandalous. Don't be afraid. In fact, when the child is born, name him Jesus. Okay, so let, just for a moment. Jesus. Uh, it does not sound like a, uh, an Aramaic or Hebrew name. Um, but let's just trace it back. Okay, Jesus. Anyone in Latin, what would Jesus sound like in Latin? You know this. Come on. Jesus, right? And Jesus is, is a rendering of the Greek. Anyone? Jesus. Jesus, right? Okay. Uh, the Greek is the rendering of an Aramaic, Yeshua. Have you heard this? Yeshua. And the Aramaic is a rendering of the Hebrew, Yehoshua. You know the name Yehoshua, Joshua, Yehoshua. Now, Yehoshua is a combination of the divine name, Yeho, and Shua, the, the verb, uh, we, we have a verb, to deliver or to save. Okay, Joshua means 
the Lord saves. Okay? Yeshua is just say Joshua super fast. Yehoshua, Yehoshua, Yeshua, 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 right? Jesus is just the Greek version, version of, of Yeshua. Jesus is the, um, the English, I guess, the, the J makes an appearance at a certain moment uh, from Jesus. But, but you see, Jesus' name means the Lord, or that is Yahweh, saves. And you couldn't imagine what that actually means unless you were able to connect it to this kid is from the Holy Spirit. It's Matthew's way of saying, yeah, that's God in your womb. That's the Lord. Who will save Israel? The Lord. Or is it Jesus? Exactly. <laughs> but now the, the, the narrator, almost I think it's the narrator, steps aside for a moment to the readers, tell, narrating the story about the angel of the Lord convincing Joseph that what's going on is in fact God's child. The narrator steps aside and says, this is to bring to fullness the words that the Lord spoke through the prophet. And he brings us back to the prophet Isaiah, chapter 7. Uh, this is an impossibly dense conversation about uh, Isaiah and how Matthew is quoting Isaiah. I'll, I'll spare you some of the details, but I will try to invite you into some of the complexity. But, but first, I want to describe to you what's happening in Isaiah chapter 7, which is where Matthew got this line that says, look, the virgin shall conceive. How are you doing? Good. Okay, Isaiah chapter 7. Now, in 7... 730s BC. So we're going back 730 years or so before uh, the story of Jesus is taking place. About somewhere between 734 and 732 BCE. Uh, there, is, there is a big bad empire called Assyria. Assyria. And they are not to be uh, messed around with. <laughs> um, and they are running the show. Well, at this point, God's people have split by now for over 100 years. They've been, they've been, there's been a schism, this unified people split. And you had a north, which was called Israel, and you had a south, which gets called Judah. And now the north is not feeling Assyria's power. So they form an alliance with Syria. Not us, Syria. Syria. How you doing? They, they team up with Syria. So these, this king named Pekach uh, in, in the north in Israel and this other king named Ritzon, uh, the king of Syria. They make a team. And they reach out to the south, to Judah. And their king Ahaz uh, He's king in, in Judah, and they say, would you join our team to take out Assyria? And Ahaz is not feeling it. <laughs> He's like, that sounds like a bad plan. Uh, they seem to win wars, not lose them. Uh, so no. So this alliance, Syria and Israel, say, let's go clobber Judah, kill Ahaz, and put our own king, Tabil, Tabil probably means like good for nothing. Let's put our own king in place. And then that king will agree to be a part of the team and we'll all go take care of Assyria. Make sense? So the prophet Isaiah comes to the king in Judah. And he says, do not make a political decision here. Do, do not try to like reason your way out. Because at this point, Judah... Ahaz is scared. The text says that they're scared and they're shaking like when wind goes into a forest and makes the leaves on the trees shake. The whole people from the leader to the, to the, the peasants are all scared to death because the, this alliance is going to come and defeat them. They're scared. And it's tempting if you're the king. Who's going to help me? 
The north and Syria are going to come and take over, put their own king in place, take our army, go to war with us, Syria, and then everybody dies, right? They're scared. They're scared out of their minds. And the prophet says, stand down. Stand still. Do not reach out for help to like Egypt or something like that. Don't be stupid. You can't fight against Assyria. In fact, God called Assyria, we'll learn in a couple of chapters. Says, he says, uh, uh, if, That is, if you don't stand in faith, you won't stand at all. Stand still. Trust God. Prophet says, God says to the prophet, ask me for proof. Ask me for proof. I'll prove it to you. Ask me. And the, and the, king, the king says, oh, no, no, no. I, I, yeah, I trust. Like, I, 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 you know, I, I'm, I'm a pious religious man. And I don't need proof. I don't want to test God by asking for proof. God just told you to ask for a sign. He says, no, no, no. The prophet says, basically, you stupid king. Like, God's going to give you a sign. See, the, 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 the king probably leaving the door open to not have to trust God. If God gives you proof, <laughs> and then you don't trust God, what kind of person are you, right? You know this story in your own life, right? He leaves the back door open, I'm guessing. The prophet says God's going to give you a sign anyway. The young woman, and Isaiah doesn't say virgin. So the young woman is going to give birth to a son. You shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. It gives him a sign. It's a sign of hope, but it's also a sign of judgment. How you hear this news is going to, to really tell you a lot about how you feel about God. But the prophet's telling him, you don't need to be afraid of this war. I'm telling you to trust me. And you don't believe. So there's a child coming who is in fact God. Now again, I'll spare you the details. But the question is, in the book of Isaiah, is that child ever born? Who, what child is the prophet talking about? Is it the king's child? Is his wife going to, is, is his wife the young woman? Is he the dad? Is it the prophet's child? The prophet has a couple of kids in chapters 7 through 9 whose names also have significant meanings. Maybe he means the prophet's wife is going to have a child. It's totally unclear. Is this child who is going to be born and called God with us, is it one of David's kids or not? If we read on, it's suggested that it might be David's kid, but it's, it's kind of left like, open-ended. But if we were to go back, how you doing? If we were to go back to chapter 6, we learn that the great king is in fact Yahweh, God. So we're left with this like mixture of like the prophet was describing the birth of a child who would suggest to Israel, to Judah, that they don't need to be afraid. But it would suggest to the one who wants help from Assyria that they're foolish. What are you going to do with the sign? Well, the king actually reaches out to Assyria and it goes terrible. Say, help me against the north. They, do, they don't, don't trust. Okay, that situation in, in Isaiah, the king's not trusting, the sign of God coming to be among you, to deliver you, bring all of that with you into Matthew and set it down in Matthew. Bring all of that with you as we go now and read Matthew. And now we're, we're seeing Joseph. Is Joseph going to be like Ahaz? You say, no, no, no. I can't do that. Too much at stake. I can't take Mary. I can't do that. The, the angel tells Joseph that this is God and the, the child is given another name. The child's name is Yahweh saves and the child shall be called God is with us. Matthew, by the way, ends his account of the gospel with, I shall be with you always, telling the story that God shall be present among his people for all ages. But we're meant to see in this story about the birth of Jesus, the birth of God in human form. 
But he's not here to just create Christianity. I think sometimes we think that, that what God is interested in doing is building up churches so they can be awesome and have whatever, exciting ministries. That's not, that's not exactly the point of God becoming a human being. And Matthew doesn't even use the language of he comes to forgive your sins. That might give the wrong impression that God is keeping a list like Santa and if you believe the right things, he'll mark you off as forgiven so that when you get to his judgment seat, you can go into heaven rather than hell. I think we're left with that impression by misreadings of Matthew as well. But he's instead, he says, his name is the Lord saves because he shall save his people from Rome. Right? Wrong. He shall save his people from what? Look at the text. Their sins. He will deliver people from their sins. Do you think you can come out from underneath the tyranny of your own sin? Do you think you can just create a good plan, read Stephen Covey or something like that, seven habits of highly effective people and get your sin in check and get your desires and your heart in order and be a better person? You think, you think the right policies in our, in our country are going to make you a better person and deliver you? Now, this is a hostage situation when we're talking about sin. It's not just that God is keeping a list of, of right and wrong. It's that sin has held us hostage, bound and gagged, keeping us hostage. We can't think or believe or act or or speak outside of being governed by sin and death. It's the situation that bums everybody out. But it's the truth, at least according to Christian scripture. Deal with it. You are bound and gagged by a captor. Forgiveness. I love that Matthew said, save us from our sin here. It paints a picture of what sin might actually be. It's like going into the house in killing the captor, in bringing the captives out. You're free now. You are no longer, you don't need to be afraid anymore. It's a new reality. Your master, sin, is dead. See, God has sent this child to set us free from our sin. Man, I've been a Christian for 25 years, something like that. I don't know, I lost count. More than half my life. I feel like I'm just discovering I can't work my way out of sin. God has to save. That's what I believe to begin with. That God saves us from our sin. He gives us a new reality. So how do I interact with that salvation then? Well, we reach out. God delivers us by reaching down and pulling us up. Do you believe that? Or do you think it's a matter of you working it out on your own? See, faith in this child is the difference between being a hostage or being set free. And the question that I think all of us as readers are being asked by Matthew is, can you buy it? Can you believe that? If we read on, Joseph does. He takes a risk. He takes one of these massive steps in his life. Fine, I'll take her into my house. I know what everyone's going to say. I know what everyone's going to say, but I believe what's happening here, that the Lord shall save through this child. Um, yeah, that's that. Um, I'll tell you what I'd like to do. Let, let me close by looking at Psalm 46. Um, let's close here. Psalm 46. I hadn't planned to do that, but it seems right. Come on, Stay tuned. <laughs> to the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to Alamot, a song, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear though the earth gives way. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble in its swelling, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, 
the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come look at the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the chariots in fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. You see that over and over, that kind of chorus, that ref- refrain, the Lord, of God, the Lord of armies is with us. God is with us. But I love, it's the most popular line, right? And Christian marketing has even figured out what to put on coffee mugs and ties and candy. Even there's candy with scriptures on it. Did you know that? What in the world? Um, But be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. That's kind of the idea here. Except when we think of be still, we picture like sitting in lotus position, um, sipping our favorite tea with our favorite Snuggie or, or whatever else. That's not what he means. What he means is stop. Harpu uh, udu in, in Hebrew. Stop. Stop. No more planning. Stop. Know that I'm God. I'll be exalted. Not you. I end wars. You start them. I end them. I burn your tanks. I put them, the end to all your political maneuvering has to go through me at some point. I end wars. So stop. Stop. That's kind of the point, I think, of Matthew verse 18 through 25. Stop. There's no way out. (laughs) There's no way out except for this child. He's the one you need. He's the one you've been longing for. He's the point. You're for him. You're living and breathing because of him. He has come to redeem you. God has not forgotten about his people. The Christmas story is more than just uh, something, um, something to, to, to pass the time or something like that. It's our origin. Now here's the thing. We live after that. We believe the same child grew up to become the kind of king that no one had ever fathomed. And we believe now that he shall return one day, appear, arrive. I don't even know how to talk about what we're hoping happens. But that's where we are now. And we're confronted with the same invitation, command. Stop. Stop. Come to the Lord. (laughs) Come to Yehoshua. (laughs) Right? I don't even like saying come to Jesus. It sounds too... uh, it, It sounds too... Christian-y, Christianese to me. Come to Jesus. I don't like it. Uh, but I do like it. Because that's, that is the point of this story, that we might know from whence our salvation comes. With that in mind, let's take the bread and the cup. Um, uh, let's, let's pray and commune. Pr- uh, bow with me. Lord uh, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for becoming like us. Thank you for suffering and putting down the thing which haunts all of us. Thank you for setting us free from from death. Uh, As scripture says that you come to set free those who live their whole lives in fear of the bondage of death. We thank you, God. Help us, Lord, uh, see in Jesus' birth and the bread and the cup here everything we need. Help us, God, as the, uh, the 25th rolls around and we, we try to remember the birth, uh, that we also remember the future. That we sense, God, in this holiday, uh, the direction, the one, the power, the the salvation that we're all longing for even if we don't know it. Grant us a a measure of faith which is composed and at peace whether the holidays are hard, uh, whether they're they're joyful. God, help us to 
to focus in on you. Thank you for this meal. It is energy for us. It's in Christ Jesus we pray.